We're gonna go ahead and get started. Before we do that, I figured I would do a quick check, make sure we're all in the same right place. So um, our session today is stress and working in mobility. So if you don't work in mobility, or you've never been stressed, you're in the wrong room. Everyone's staying? Okay. So welcome. Um, I'm your moderator today. My name is Meredith Kennedy, and I am the Senior Vice President of Global Account Management for DwellWorks and DwellWorks Living. I'm based in Detroit, Michigan in the United States, and I have been stressed and working in global mobility for 25 years. So um, the thing I was excited about doing this panel is that at first when I saw the title, I thought it was going to be about the stress that our assignees go through, our customers. Um, but Yura wanted to kind of flip this discussion and talk through the lens of me, of you, of us, the service providers whose job it is every day to make sure that we minimize the stress that those assignees are going through. And I think um, we're really charged with an inherently imperfect situation and the possibility of making that more perfect. And I don't know about you, but that's a lot of pressure and can cause some stress. Um, so, and I think the, the events of the last three, four years globally on a macro level have just added to the imperfection that the employees are going through and really um, exacerbated the challenges that we have to navigate them through those imperfections. And I think navigate through is the right word because in mobility, we don't have the luxury of avoiding stress. We truly have to navigate through it. And the panel that I have with me today has done just that successfully. So we're thrilled to have them. We've got a slide to introduce them. Um, we've got Adam, Claire, Rhea, and Rob. I didn't say that they navigated it without having any impact, uh, feeling any of the effects of stress, um, but they do have some great solutions today. Um, okay, so if this is all about kind of talking through what the sources of stress are, what the potential solutions for getting through stress are, and then we also wanna get have a discussion about the kind of the positive byproduct of investing in our employees um, comfort, joy, lack of stress. So that's kind of what we're set up to do today. Um, but again, we'll take a quick pause because I think laughter is a really good solution to stress. Um, so I want to show on the slides a few quotes. The first one by um, country music star Reba. So we're gonna take just a minute and take her advice and exercise our funny bone. So this next slide. I mean, I love my job, but some days I definitely feel like that. And I think that kind of epitomizes mobility, right? Oh, yeah, sometimes. And come on, nobody really likes Mondays. And the final quote here, the good news about this one is all of us in this room have already done the first four steps. Um, I want to go on record as saying I am not recommending step five to any of you. In fact, we would like you all to return to your workplace and if all goes well in the next hour, maybe you'll have a few tips to make that a more joyful experience for you. So with that, um, I think we'll kick off and dive in um, Claire, can I start with you and have you talk a little, kind of set the stage for how you see stress in mobility? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Claire Williams. Um, I've been stressed in mobility for over 30 years. Uh, most of the time I've spent in Asia and Middle East and lived in uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Doha, Vancouver, and now Thailand. So I've also been through a lot of stressful moves uh, as a as a customer, um, and uh, in my last, currently I work with uh, uh, lovely Louise in uh, Easy Tiger Executive Search. Um, in previous roles, I've mostly been in the RMC world, and in my last company we did, post-COVID, we did a lot of research um, and surveys of the teams, because we had teams in so many different countries. Um, a lot of them were still working, obviously, from home, and it changed the way that we work, and we, we spent a lot of time getting feedback from two and a half thousand 
um, employees that were working around the world with, within mobility. And we spent a lot of time doing uh, kind of understanding the root causes, look at some of the solutions. And I think that there's a few areas that you know, really stood out for me is that even though um, when you look at the root causes, and we'll speak about a few of them uh, as we go through this session, whether or not they are seen as kind of direct uh, or controllable, um, let's say, or uncontrollable, there are actually steps then the organization, the manager can take to actually help and support their team. So I think that was kind of one of the, uh, the main areas that we, that we, we saw. The second was, especially in Asia, working from home was actually quite new. Um, I know globally, you know, the US and Europe, it's more common, but until COVID happened, hardly anybody ever worked from home, even though they were allowed to one day a week. Um, and especially in locations in India, where you had people that moved out of the office area in Manila, for example, they just weren't set up, um, you know, to, to within the environment. They had broader families that they lived with. They didn't have the separate office. They'd be working off the dining table, etc. And actually, when people think of working from home, it's giving um, a potential solution for people that are, you know, find that stressful, commuting in and out, but it actually added to the stress. So that was kind of uh, one of the other. And I think the last piece is that um, companies today, there are so many competing priorities, whether or not, you know, with the overall kind of downturn in 2023, spinning over into 24, looking at, you know, kind of where to get the profits, um, making sure they're building out their technology, DE&I, and then also sustainability. And like the mental health side, it doesn't always get the attention that, you know, because there are so many different priority. So that was kind of a lot of what we you know, kind of looked at during that research. Yeah, there's a lot there, Claire. But let's touch on the mental health a little bit more. And I know, Rob, you had a few statistics about this. So, yeah, I think, I mean, number one, I think Eura are, is, is probably the one place in the world where you, it's full of lovely people who, who all love each other, um, probably more, more than anywhere that I, that I go. But I think as business owners, and most of the people in this room are business owners, we, we, we face stresses from owning a business. You know, those are the pressures of owning a business. But I think sometimes the focus, as you said at the beginning, Meredith, is all about the assignee experience. So we say, oh, it's very stressful for the assignee. We stop and don't always think about all of the people that are involved in that ecosystem, the stakeholders in that process, whether it's the consultant that's taking the family out and sitting in a car with them for three days, listening to all of their worries and concerns and problems, whether it's the RMC who's doing the briefing calls and listening to all their problems and concerns, or even the corporate client HR mobility team who's getting all of the moans and complaints about how things aren't going well, that's a really stressful environment to, to work in. And so if you look at customer service, there was a, a company, British Telecom, did a survey um, just before the pandemic and they looked at 1,793 of their customer service staff, both call centers and face-to-face -face, um, employees and they carried out a research process for six months. It was the Oxford side business school and for six months every week they asked the employees to fill out a form to talk about how happy, stressed, etc. and they were also looking at the work that they conducted during that period. So over that period of time, six months, 1,793 employees, the key fact that they came up with was that happy employees are 13% more productive than unhappy employees, which is kind of crazy because in this world where we're all facing pressures of price and is there a return on investment for that, clearly if we can get 13% more from a happy employee, really that's a really good investment. PD, PwC did some research um, a couple of years ago looking at, at, at the cost of wellness within organizations um, and their research said that for every one pound spent on wellness had a five pound benefit in terms of company productivity. So, so there's really some evidence out there that we should be looking at all of us from, from a wellness perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're lucky enough to have a trained psychologist on our panel today. So, oh, oh, you know what, before I do that, I know you think everyone in this room knows you, but I forgot to have you introduce yourself. So do okay. you want to take the opportunity? Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Rob Fletcher, um, co-founder of Heart Relocation. Um, I started my mobility journey and my Euro journey in about 1873. 
it certainly feels that way. Um, I'm still only 14, I look good. Um, and yeah, if you don't know me, come and say hi, please. Excellent, thanks. Now I'll pass it to Ria, and you can start by introducing yourself and then okay. talking a little bit more about this topic. Yes, hi, hi everybody, I'm Ria. I'm from Formula Group in India. Um, I worked as a psychologist for a few years, three years, before I transitioned into global mobility in 2020, the best time, stress-free time to come into the industry. Um, um, so before, like when we got the panel, the first thing that I talked about, or the first thing that I thought about was what even is stress? So I think I'm gonna like um, expand a little on that so that everybody in this room is like on the same page. What even is stress? What are we talking about? Um, stress is essentially a physiological and psychological response to a situation in the environment that we perceive as a threat, right? Um, in evolutionary terms, the stress response originated with a very important function. It was meant to help us survive, right? It was meant to help us identify a threat in the environment, and then either fight it or flight it in order to survive, right? And that is why it's also called the fight or flight response today. Now, we don't have a single threat in our life today, but we have a lot of pervasive factors that keep triggering this stress response, right? Um, and that is what we're dealing with as individuals, as professionals, and as organizations. How can we manage our stress response better? Um, and the stress response, I'm sorry, I'm so nervous and the lights are in my eyes. Is it all right if I get up? Okay, wonderful. <laughs> sorry, guys, because I keep seeing myself and I keep looking at myself then. <laughs> so I'm going to stand up. Okay, yeah. So the stress response exists. Let's look at it as existing on a spectrum, right? We have an adaptive stress response, which is essentially us being able to answer what all can I do to cope with this situation, right? This is a healthy stress response. It's important for us. It allows us to identify challenges we want to take on. It almost keeps us motivated at work. We want to have this, right? It's important. Then we have a reactive stress response, which is usually us wondering, what do I do to cope with this? I'm not sure I can cope with it. This is when we often get a little overwhelmed. We may be um, overthinking, overanalyzing situations. We often need to zoom out a little. And then we have an overwhelmed stress response, which is when we say, well, I, I can't deal with this, right? Um, and so the key takeaway here is that it's not about being stress-free, but it's about figuring out, number one, being aware of what factors in our environment are causing stress. Number two, recognizing where do we lie on this spectrum as individuals, as professionals, how do our teams respond, and what resources we need, internal and external, to move along this spectrum. And I think that's what we're all um, here exploring today with everybody. So, and I'm gonna now sit back down. <laughs> it, was a, it was a perfect, yeah, there we Thank go. You. Thank you very much, guys, I appreciate it. <laughs> I think you handled your stress in that moment perfectly. Um, so let's dive into a little bit kind of the sources of stress, what we do need to react to in that way. Mm -hmm. And um, Rob hit on this a little bit. Um, in the next slide, you'll see that Zendaya frames it up like this. Um, yeah, but I really like Adam's analogy of the glass balls. So. I think that you're going to stand up also, perhaps. Yes, Adam. I'm not, I'm not stressed about standing up anymore because we did it first. Okay. So. Good. <laughs> um, so I think I've met a lot of you here. Uh, this is my first Yura, awesome event, so thank you for all making this welcome. Um, I can get rid of my green lanyard now. I think I'm officially a, a yura -er or something. <laughs> um, but for those of you that don't know me, I'm Adam from China. Um, I own a DSP in China, and stress-induced entre entrepreneur's baldness is a real thing. So, but um, I want to kind of give an analogy here, and I just have a question, and I, I probably see a lot of hands raised, but in this room, destination service providers, can you raise your hand so I know who I'm talking to? That's a lot of hands. Next question is, because obviously we're all here, we're in management or business development or supply chain or whatever, who has been actual DS consultant out on the field, who has actually started as a consultant? Okay, so I'm talking to you guys for this one. So, and I will stand up. Um, for me, and I took this analogy from a, a goal setting training, and you, you kind of have to picture the, the glass ball, right? A sphere, very fragile. That's your assignee. It's very easy not to drop this ball. You can actually pick it up, catch it behind your back. It's not hard, right? So you can keep this glass ball 
safe. But that's not the only ball that you have. You have the account stakeholders. This could be the RMC, in-house mobility, wherever the client came from. Again, juggling two balls, it's pretty easy. You're not going to drop them. And if that was our only job in destination services, there probably wouldn't be very many escalations. But then you have internal stakeholders, your management, the account manager, your Canadian boss, whatever. So they're putting stress on you because you have to keep them happy as well. So all of a sudden that one's on your head and you're kind of balancing these three balls. And it's getting a little bit complicated. And you know, for us, we have our housing providers, whether it's a direct landlord, corporate housing, service department, or whatever. And I think for me, the, uh, as a destination service provider, of course, we have to focus on the assignee and the company, but we're naive to say that negotiation is not about balance. So you do have to keep the housing provider happy. You have to kind of develop those relationships. So then you have the three glass balls, one on your head, and now you have the housing provider, and you're trying to juggle all of these glass balls and not drop any of them. Then, of course, tenancy management, you have the air conditioning and repairman, um, all the property management, all the things that can go wrong there. You have the crossover vendors, all of a sudden household goods gets involved, or one of the international schools, or whatever. And so you're juggling all of these glass balls. And if you only have one assignee, it's relatively easy, but you have 10, 20, 30 assignees. And for me, the challenge, uh, and I, I developed a training internally for my onboarding. You know, when I talk about these glass balls, when I'm training new staff, I talk about everyone that you have to manage and the EQ that it takes. It's easy to be a great consultant. It's very difficult to be an excellent consultant because you have to have that EQ to balance all of these glass balls and not drop a single one. Because if you drop one, it's probably another one going to fall right after it and it shatters it. And that's where the escalation comes from. And that's where the, the finger's pointing, okay, you, you, know, you made a mistake, how are you going to resolve this? Whatever the escalation is, it's because you've dropped one of those relationships. And so it's not just the assignee, there's so much around it. And so the, the EQ that it takes to be an amazing, excellent uh, destination service consultant, and you can shift this to any, any service provider, but it's a lot. And it's a lot of stress on our shoulders. And so I think, you know, we're going to talk about uh, working with stress, how to resolve stress, and how to keep these glass balls in the air. That's great. Thanks, Adam. So if that's the who, that's the stakeholders of who we're trying to help, there's also the what, the other impacts of stress. So, Claire, I know you have a, a long list of the yeah, just things. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I did my own little mini survey as well on LinkedIn last week to try to get um, some feedback from people within the industry, and I'll, I'll give you kind of the results that I've got back, and it was what we see as the root causes of stress and kind of what, what are people, um, you know, kind of identify. So 42% said workload, caseload, I think uh, quite obvious. 31% is the high expectations of our customers and our, our clients or the RMC, you know, depending on what uh, your role is. 19% um, um, job insecurity, because I think, you know, with the, the state of the industry at the moment and the challenges and some layoffs that people are seeing, kind of, uh, I'm stressed because I, will I keep my job and, you know, I've got all these uh, respon home personal responsibilities. Um, and then the, the, the rest of it really was more kind of external things that are outside of your control, like a, a COVID pandemic or wars and you know things that uh, we're seeing but when we did the study that I, I mentioned earlier um, I think you know it was very obvious so as I said there are ones that are seen as being control uh, controllable and I think the obvious ones of caseload workload an interesting one that came up was time out PT uh, you know personal time off because even though we think of that as meant to be the time when we actually can relax with our family etc how many people here take time off but you're constantly on your emails or you get your phone. You're dreading going back to the first day back because you know you're going to get a couple of hundred emails. Um, and you've also relied on other people to do things for you, which, you know, everybody's different, right? You know, they can be the best consultant in the world, but whether or not they know your customer like you did and, you know, they deliver the services that you, you expect. So I thought that was quite interesting is the PTO was like very high in the ranking. Um, and then what we see is more um, non-controllable, but still are when we get volume surges, how many people here, you know, a big surprise because they suddenly got a hundred initiations from either an RMC or a client for a group move. And we certainly, if I look at 2022, when all the businesses started really opening up, there was a lot of pent up demand. 
Um, and even in fairness, even the, the clients, the in-house mobility, they also didn't know, you know, kind of how quickly borders are opening up, have they got people that are sat there waiting to be redeployed, etc. So that also put, um, you know, one of the main root causes that we saw in 2022. And I think the other th main thing was um, just general things outside your control. And, and I'll give you a very quick prime example. If I look back over my 30 years, by far my most stressful day ever was um, we had a very senior person that was moving from Shanghai to Beijing and they needed to submit their passport for endorsement. Um, they were due to go out, they had the leadership coming in from the US and they were due to do a, an Asia visit and we lost the passport, well we didn't, but our supplier did in Beijing. And it, I s it wasn't me. And it wasn't me. <laughs> and I have to say that I think I've got phone calls that day. It was when Obama was in uh, president and I think he's literally the only person who didn't call me from the US because every single person called me and there's things like that and you can do mitigating measures, you know, look at, you know, but at the end of the day, they are the type, type of stressful events, I think, that we, uh, that we come across and, you know, making sure we talk about some of the solutions, but um, yeah, I think that's the challenge in what we do is those, is when things come up that we're not expecting, um, that is not on our playbook. Um, and I think, you know, with the roles that everybody's got in, in the city, in this room, et cetera, that's really some of the kind of root causes that we saw. Yeah, a very good list. And I'm particularly interested in that PTO thing. I can definitely relate to that. At Dwellworks, we um, jokingly call vacations dwellcations. So it's kind of a little bit of work and a little bit of vacation. And I think that's because of the high standard that we all have, that we want things to go well because of the empathetic nature of everyone in this room. So definitely can't fault us for that, but it's not necessarily the healthiest thing to do. Rob, I know you had some additional thoughts on, on the causes. Yeah, so I, I think, it, I mean, it's really interesting because when we, we, we've said it already, that we think about wellness and well-being and mobility, and it's always focused on the assignee, and we do very little kind of internal searching of ourselves. And in our industry, there is a tendency for us to be quick to blame. When something doesn't go right, people tend to point fingers at who hasn't done what they should have done. Um, and I don't think we actually ever take a step back to think about that, the entire ecosystem because pretty much from, from our corporate clients to the RMCs to the DSPs, probably one consistent thing is that we're all being asked to do more for less. And you know, when um, Francis spoke um, at the opening of the conference and talked about AI, Lots of people are talking about AI is going to replace everybody's jobs and AI can do all of this and do all of that. And I think that creates that insecurity for people um, because they, they don't want to let anybody down <laughs> because somebody's looking at me. But we're all in the same boat. And I think if we were all a little bit more sympathetic, took a little more time, just a few moments to ask better questions, if we're given some information that we don't understand to actually question that information and, and seek clarification, we might find that we actually end up with, with better results. So, you know, I think that what we all do, I mean, we all do different jobs, whether you're the corporate HR, whether you're RMC or a DSP or an immigration provider or a household goods provider, we're all interacting with, with an employee who is, by the very nature of the process they're going through, exposed to extraordinary amounts of stress and pressure. And we take that on. You know, there's, there's a lot of the saying that there's a trouble halved or trouble shared is a trouble halved. Um, and, and that's what we do. We take people's troubles on, on our, on our own. We take them on uh, to kind of sort them out and help them. But in doing that, we're also absorbing some of that. <laughs> we're, we're absorbing some of that tension, some of that stress, some of that strain. Um, and we don't prepare people for it, I don't believe, as an industry. I, I mean, I can ask a question here. Um, how many of your teams, the people that go out and show people properties or move their stuff or deal with files, have had any kind of counselling themselves about how to deal with stress? See, one, one, one brave enough person to put their hand up in the room. So are we not also, I may not be the most popular person right now, but are we also not therefore Whatever. part of the problem? I mean, in, in the fact that we're not preparing our own teams to how to deal with the stress of the jobs that we're creating for them. I still like you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Bria. No, the only thing I'll add is, um, in addition to, because 
I feel like every industry has things that cause stress much like ours, whether that's workload, whether those are expectations, we're balancing it all. But I think one thing that um, is sort of the glue that decides how we experience stress um, in our work life is, um, uh, is the understanding that stressed people stress people. Right. So company culture plays a very important role, how our leadership, how our teams, how our co-workers deal with stress and how they respond to stress influences how we as individuals will um, respond to stress in our workplace. So we can't exist, um, we can't wake up one day and be like, I'm going to have the best day, deal with all the challenges and walk into work and do it alone. We're dealing with a lot of people that influence how we experience stress. So there's a lot of spillover stress in companies that we also need to deal with. So. Yeah. Right. And I think, Adam, I mean, you're seeing the opposite of that is stress can roll downhill and. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, stress, there's another word you can use, but stress flows downhill. And, <laughs> um, you know, I look at the leadership in this room is, you know, positivity can flow downhill. Um, I'm annoyingly positive in, in general. And so I think your stat was 13% more productive. I'm 130% more productive. So. <laughs> wow. And, and so for me, I, you know, I will always uh, share positivity with uh, my staff. If I ever get uh, great feedback from a client or whatever, I'll, I'll share it down and positivity, positivity flows downhill, but also it can flow uphill. So I have a folder called happy emails that I share up where, you know, wherever we're, um, you know, wherever the uh, uh, file came from. Um, do I have time for a quick story? Yeah, sure. Cool. Um, so this was 2008. I just started in the industry, and I'll do quick education on China. Not everybody speaks the same language in China. Everybody learns Mandarin in school, but then every city has different dialects, and they're very different. So when my staff in Shanghai don't want me to understand what they're saying, they just switch to the Shanghai dialect. I have no clue what they're saying. So I was in Chengdu, and this is in southwest China where the pandas are from, and you know I was. It was my first business trip to Chengdu, and we had a manager there, and she kept on hanging up the phone. Now, how fail hangs up the phone? How fail? And I'm like, what is she saying? So I asked my staff uh, what she was saying, and it was just like, okay, well, uh, the direct line tra translation would be like, ma fan, like troublesome. And so every time she's hanging up the phone, she's like, ah, crap, Sh ah, shit, ah, ah. No. And like, she was so stressed out, and so she didn't know how to deal with stress. And so again, I was new to the industry, and so we were uh, a very baby company at the time. And so I looked at, okay, well, what can I do as a manager? How can I pr protect her? Because I think as a manager, we need to protect our, staffs, our, our staff. We need to protect their stress. And so I'll put in the systems and processes in place. And so one of the core values I put into the company was balance. Um, and years later, all I heard about was work-life balance. I'm like, oh, you guys stole my word. But um, you know, for me, having that balance and, and helping helping our staff deal with stress. And you know, for me, positivity flows downhill. So sharing down, and if you have your partners, I mean, I, for our partners as well, I don't hesitate to share with them because I, I want them to feel that warmth because when there is an escalation, well, they're gonna react a little bit better because they're more productive. So I think it's our job in this room, the leadership in the industry, to share positivity. My first boss, um once said to me, and this is literally 23 years ago or something, and it's really stuck with me, that you should always look for work-life balance, that that was core. And you also needed to realize that you weren't gonna find that in a day or a week. You needed to look over a longer subset of time. And there's gonna be times that your family needs you more, and there's gonna be times that your job has more demands for you. But if you can feel confident that over a longer period of time you found balance, then you're doing it right. And I. I think we need to kind of epitomize that and understand that people do have different needs at different times. Um, I did find one other solution that I wanted to put um, up on the screen for you all. Um, and Claire, I think you have some more constructive ideas, so I'll pass the mic to you. No worries, thanks. Um, yeah, when, uh, when we did all of our research, we spent a lot of time with all the information we were given to try to see what, what can we do to help the teams, help the managers as well, right? Because I think we talk about stress rolling down, but it also there's a lot of stress on different levels within an organization too. Um, and I think one of the, the first things that we did is try to look a lot more about workforce planning. Now, we know when the busy seasons are, generally, although there's been, it's been a bit out of kilt in the last uh, two, three years. 
So really making sure we've got a much more agile workforce. So I understand, you know, a lot of you, if you've got your own um, DSPs, et cetera, and you might have five, 10 employees, that's more of a challenge for you because you don't necessarily have the breadth of um, skills, et cetera, but really from the planning as to making sure well ahead we were bringing in additional staff to cover that. Um, you know, using companies and looking at options like Upwork, et cetera, and bringing in contractors, cross-skilling. So um, when, for example, immigration was very busy during certain times, but household goods was quieter, having the ability to, to cross-train and get them to support that team. Um, and if anybody knows me, I'm big into data. Um, I, I think my nickname was the spreadsheet queen at, at work. But I, I love, like, I love numbers. I love looking at histo uh, no, historic patterns, et cetera, to try and do as much planning as possible so that you've got the teams ready. So I think that was kind of one of the, the key areas. Training as well, making sure that people had the tools um, that they need and not just, you know, I think, like I said, when do we even do cross-cultural training to our, to our teams, right? And they, they're working with all different cultures. Obviously, the, the obvious onboarding that you get, but understanding the projects and the systems, uh, and really re-looking at the learning and development side to give them all the support um, that they can. So that was kind of one of the other key areas. And then the last piece was when we looked at those root causes, especially when we looked at those that were working remote. As I say, remote working for Asia, at least, is very new, right? It, it, it was very, people love to come into the office. They don't necessarily have the space at home to actually work from home as well. And also the infrastructure. So people just didn't have fast technology, right? The, the internet access, system glitches all the time and the amount of stress that that was putting on them. So really making sure, number one, as a, that everybody has a laptop rather than it being previously it only been managers that could have laptops versus your desktop making sure that they have the, I can't think of the technical word, like the widgets, the, the, the fastest internet possible, um, and also making sure that our IT support, because historically in companies, IT support, if you call them up, they only want to deal with company issued equipment, but as soon as somebody says they're working off their own equipment, then, oh, sorry, we can't help you. So really looking at areas like that to, to help, you know, kind of support, and that worked very well. Yeah, all very important thoughts. Rob, did you have other solutions you wanted to share with the crowd? I, I mean, I, I don't think there is an easy solution, to be honest with you. I think there, there needs to be some fundamental changes. I mean, uh, personally, in our own company, um, we, we wanted to live by, by what we are. Um, so we limit the caseload. So the number of glass balls that are required to be juggled at a particular time are limited to make it easier. Um, but you do see, you know, there are, you know, I've, I've interviewed people who, uh, who, when I ask them what their caseload is, give me some really scary numbers. I interviewed somebody recently that told me that they were looking after 215 assignees. And my question was, how do you cope? His response was, I don't. <laughs> he worked from six in the morning till nine at night and wanted to leave the company he was at because he just couldn't cope. So I think we, you know, we need to give something back. We need to listen to our audience um, and, and try and give people time. I think that's the most precious commodity we have in our industry is time. Giving people time to ask the questions that are important. More importantly, to have the time to listen to the answers that you get. Because, you know, how many times when you're talking to a sign you go, oh, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, great. I'm going to do this and I've done that. Thank you. Goodbye. It's a five minute call and it's done and it's easy and I've got another 500 to make. Sometimes it's better to say to the person, and so, okay, you know, we've done all of this stuff. How are you feeling? Oh, fine. Really? Well, actually, this isn't going so well. That's not going so well. And then you've opened the door to a 45-minute Pandora's box of problems <laughs> that you've got to listen to. And you can't, if you've not got the time to listen to it, you're trying to end the call as quickly as possible and not resolving that issue. Um, and then once you've had, if you've got the time to listen to it, what do you do with that information? Because if I've listened to your problems for 45 minutes and then I've got to get on another call, I'm not going to spend any time because I'm on to the next call uncovering another 45 minutes potentially of problems and I've forgotten whose problem's whose. So it's actually having the time to build the time into the process to once you've uncovered a problem, take the time to think about how do I make this experience better? 
And I think we don't do that enough for our own employees either. We don't give them the space and the time, and I think we should. And, and going back to, you know, as, as a trained psychologist, you, you know this, when anybody trains to be a counsellor, one of the first things they teach you as a counsellor is how to deal with <laughs> the stresses that you adapt for being a counsellor. And, and we don't offer any of our employees that kind of training. Um, so we should. Yeah, I think that um, AI to me is not a stressor. AI is part of the solution to this because I do think we sometimes are forced to cut some corners. And if we actually had time to have that conversation, to do the meaningful part, to do the customized, individualized solution creation for these people whose lives are in our hands, it would be great if that meant that this quick email or that quick template or this quick, everybody asks the same four questions so we have a chat bot that covers this. If that can all be done in that kind of way, the people that we're working with are not going away. They just can't, they just, I'm sorry, it doesn't, she did not scare me, Francis, we're here. But I'm really excited about the opportunity to alleviate some of those burdens, those administrative tasks. Um, so that our people can really do the important things that, that our customers are looking for. Yeah. Rhea, did you have anything um, you um, wanted to add to that? I mean, I can just talk about what we do in um, our organization if we're talking about solutions to stress. Um, I think first and foremost, if we look at the function of stress is awareness. So I think it also becomes very important for us as um, team leaders to ask the team what they're stressed about. So we do the... We do this mental well-being survey at Formula, which is every half year and every year, um, which is a very internal, a very interesting internal survey where we go through everything, exploring um, workload, if how our employees feel um, with their workload, are they happy with that? Um, if they're able to, if they have expectations clear, how would they rate their work-life balance? What their experience is like when they want to take a leave? Is it easy? Are they having any difficulty? And we do this survey every year, and it is, I think, one of the best things that we inculcated in our company, because people respond and they are honest, and it becomes very easy then to deal with the stressors that they have in their life. Um, we also ask if they're interested in the type, if they're enjoying their daily work, and if they're interesting in um, sort of exploring a different role within the company. So then that also allows us to t identify people that want to, um, you know, change their role within an organization. Recently, we had two people from the business development team who came um, into the business development team, say they were interested in immigration, and now they're very good immigration consultants. So it's very helpful to do that. We do this every year, and it's amazing. Um, I will take no credit for it. It's the HR team that does that. So I think another major solution is to have a very good HR team who is able to do this because it takes a lot of bandwidth for leaders to build these surveys. So having a nice HR team is very important. Um, and another thing that Claire had mentioned was training programs, building, coping for our people. That is very important. What we do at Formula Group is we have a people development team. Uh, which includes me and um, our head of mobility and our uh, relocation manager who's been doing this for 15 years. And we built training programs for our teams. The last one we did was called the Escalation Management Training Program for our consultants. And we just went through all the common stressors that they experience or escalations that come up during the assignee life cycle, which are usually not in the SOP, small things that they have to deal with and how can they respond to that. And that actually resulted in us building this very interesting escalation management database, which is just um, this living, breathing, evolving database of the common stressors that come along and how to respond to them. Um, and that's been very helpful because we can give that to new consultants that come on board and consultants have that as a tool to look at. Um, and it also keeps the conversation going. So I think that is another solution. And a third solution that I have is um, something that I met, I met an organization that does this and I thought it was brilliant. They externalize a space to deal with stress. So in India, there are certain hospitals that run this um, corporate stress clinic and then they um, affiliate or get affiliated with the organization. And then they give um, employees well-being tools um, and a space to maybe uh, connect with a therapist, etc. So that's a very nice, easy way to bring in like stress management um, in your organization without having to take on a lot of the responsibilities of leading those programs. So, um, yeah. Great. Excellent. I think those are a lot of really nice practical ideas. 
Um, the thing with all of those ideas, as you said, they have to be done by somebody. There's a lot of effort that goes into some of this, which unfortunately could cause more stress. Yeah. So I would like to think that there's an ROI for our efforts in this area. Um, uh, all of our businesses are looking for that as we're restricted in what we can do in this kind of time. So um, let's talk a little bit about what are the benefits for really investing in the stress of our teams, our employees, ourselves. Um, Rob, you talked about productivity. I don't know if you want to expand on that. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm not sure how easy it is to expand on. It's a very basic fact. And I think, you know, we all intrinsically know that happy people are nicer to be around, they're more productive, they get more done. And it's kind of, this, this actually puts some, some empirical data behind that. One, one of the interesting um, things, bearing in mind this was for, from a telecoms company in the UK, um, there was another factor that affected happiness, and it was marked, and that was the weather. <laughs> People are happier on sunnier days than they are on rainy days. Um, so so it, sometimes it's the external factors. It's not the job itself, it's what's going on around them. So you know, making the environment that you work in a more comfortable environment for people, creating a more homely space, rather than it just being an office, I think is really important. Um, and just, you get more. We, we, run a, we don't run a nine to five clock in our business because we know that most of our clients, the assignees, are not running a nine to five UK London time frame. They're six in the morning or seven in the evening. And so we allow our employees to make their own time up based on the places that they're looking after. And I think having some flexibility just d delivers better results. Um, and uh, this may sound a little triumphant, and, I, and I'm, I, I'm unashamed at it. Our current net promoter score from employee feedback is 93. 93 is a world-class net promoter score, and that has to be, from my perspective, testament to the space and the time that we've given our consultants and our partners, because you're all part of that, or many of you are directly part of that 93 score. Um, we wouldn't do it if we, we wouldn't get those scores, and that's testament to it, I think. And I think that probably breeds loyalty and retention and all of those things. I, I hope so. Yeah. We're only four years old, so I can't really talk about that yet. Well, pe people can leave in four years. That's true. <laughs> um, Claire, did you have other res positive results? Um, yeah, I think very similar to what Rob says, and it's also the net promoter scores that you'll get outcome in terms of from your customers and your clients, because we all know happy, if, if our consultants are happy, then that also increases the, the satisfaction of the customers. And they feel it, like how many, like we used to do with, it sounds like more basic training, but we used to say, when you're talking on the phone, smile. They can't see you, but the way you come across is a lot more positive. Um, and you know, it, customers feel it. So I think the retention of customers, the retention of the employees as well, uh, you know, kind of, and we all know the longer we, we keep our employees then, the knowledge that they build up, the, the ability to you know, provide better service is marked, marked different than if you've got a high turnover. So I think that they are really the two key, two key areas that we found. Absolutely. Ria? I mean, I think they've covered it all, but um, I would say apart from the obvious advantages of investing in stress management, I think we should also be looking at stress management as an opportunity to um, learn more about our people and the processes. It's a wonderful way to identify gaps in your processes that you may not have seen. Um, and that helps you build better standardized um, service delivery and happier people. So, yeah. Yeah, I, think, I thought that was an interesting conversation we had. And I have one last slide that kind of shows this. And I thought this meme kind of depicted it in, in an interesting way because it's like, we could laugh at this, that there's the regular model that we're supposed to do work by, and then when things get crazy, you throw that out the door. But actually, the fact that you can throw it out the window or the door, wherever you want to throw it, um, might mean there's something to that. Maybe we're make, overcomplicating things. Maybe we need to take a moment to recognize, wait, I was able to do this faster when I was required to do it faster. So what can I learn from that? What, maybe I need to really assess my processes. Again, build in some automation, simplify some things, be smart, work smarter, not harder. I think our employees can all appreciate that. And this is kind of an ongoing gift um, from investing in, in reducing their stress. So 
um, setting us up for the su success in the future, I think is critical <coughs> from, a, from a process perspective. It's kind of funny, it just uh, something came to my mind. A few years ago, I had a program, <coughs> it's called Educate You, more than a few years ago, you know, 10, 12 years ago. <laughs> and so there's certain things I can't train. I can't teach my staff German. So if we have German clients, I'm, you know, I'm not able to help them with that. And so they were able to take this fund and, and take classes every month. And one of my uh, staff, she applied to take yoga. And my HR manager at the time like, said no, right? She, she wouldn't approve it. I'm like, why not? And she, I'm like, it's helping her with stress. And it was kind of like this, a bit of a cultural element that I had to deal with. Um, but over the years, now we will uh, you know, fund gym memberships and all that just for that sort of the wellness program. And, um, you know, Rob, you mentioned the uh, score, but like for me, we have a 90% staff retention rate. And I think it grew from that, you know, allowing the flexibility, allowing the wellness and creating that environment. So it's just something that came up to my mind as uh, we were talking. Yeah, and I think it's fair that not everything's gonna work for everyone in every situation. It might fit your culture uh, globally or the company culture, but trying some of these things and really listening to your employees, I think is a key part of what we talked about today. Um, I don't mean to stop abruptly, but I'm noticing the clock and want to make sure that people have time for questions or insights. What solutions do you all have? What ROI have you gotten from some of these investments? I'd love to take a minute. And the wonderful, fantastic, marvelous Peggy Love um, has the microphone. So I'm going to let her, if you have a question, she'll come find you. Thank you. Yes, hello, hi. Uh, my name is Kaushik. I'm coming from Human Entrance in Sweden. Speaking of stress, that's a stressful name sometimes for a company to be called Human Entrance and try to sell immigration services, but that's what we do. Um, I have a couple of... Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone. I think it was a really interesting discussion. I love the T-shirt, Adam. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, I found this in Madrid, and I was on my way to the airport, and I was stressed because I, I couldn't get everybody's sizes to get one for, out there for uh, the panel. I was stressed out on the way to the airport. No, but it's lovely. I love it. And thank you for all the insights, especially Ria, starting with all what stress is about. was very interesting. And uh, I've been in industry for 23 years now, so I have a long experience of stress. I was a destination service consultant to start with, and then I worked my way through the entire organization. I've been married for 18 years as well, so that's also <laughs> fairly stressful. But anyway, to come to my two insights that I would like to share with you and also with you all. One thing that I have learned through experience is that micro breaks help a lot in the daily life. So in the day-to-day -day stress we feel, if we, and I, I forget this myself at times, but I try to implement it as often as I can, and I realize whenever I take those five minutes of break in between in the day and just breathe and just relax and don't think about anything, then I get my pulse down, and then I can start again fresh. So that those micro breaks are more important than we think. That's one thing. And another thing which we implemented in our company many years ago, uh, it's, uh, it was my idea, but unfortunately we're not living with that anymore, <laughs> but uh, it's a, it, I, I feel it worked for a while. Uh, proactive hour. So once a week we have a proactive hour. We had a proactive hour. We're going to implement it again if I can have my say. So once, uh, once a week the entire staff sits, and it's a dis dis decided time, we have a proactive hour. You think through the week's challenges, the week's plans, and then you start doing the proactive things, those things that you usually don't do for your uh, assignees or transferees. And if you start doing the proactive things, then the stress level goes down for you and for the transferee, because they think that you are proactive. You're asking them things that's going to happen in two weeks from now. They know you're on top of your game. So that type of small, small um, uh, initiatives can also sometimes help. Yeah. That's all I want to share. Thank you. That's great. Making time for that's going to save you a lot of time elsewhere. I like both of those I, ideas. I like a lot. that. I'm going to write it down. Just yeah. so I don't forget. I, I'd like <laughs> to I say just, yeah. just a quick point when you said about the micro breaks. One thing that I rolled out was how many times do we have back to back meetings? So everyone always puts an hour in, they see in your calendar is available. So, so I said you're only allowed to do 45 minutes. You know, they, they, we shouldn't have a one hour meeting unless it's really about it in depth so that people get 15 minutes between rather than having to jump off, whether it's use the restroom, have a quickly reply. And it, people gave me some really good feedback about that as well. Yeah, so I think we, I mean, it's funny how 
independent review will come up with very similar solutions. So in our company, we call it window time. So actually, for every, for every meeting you have, you have to factor in window time. Mm -hmm. Window time is time to stand up and look out the window. Yes. <clears throat> if I may add, hi. So uh, my name is Laura. I'm from Move My Talent. And um, I think one of maybe one insight or suggestion that I have, but also to get your feedback on this as well, it doesn't cost anything, but to just raise the awareness of our teams that our industry is different in regards of how quick, I, I very often talk to our team that we kind of are the buffer between the real life, you know, the authorities, the landlords, the whatnot, and the assignees. So we are the buffer who takes the hit. And we're also the buffer between the clients, you know, when it comes to legislation change and lobbying things. So we always take the hit. And there is high stress level. And now, compared to very many other industries where you are working on a very long project, you know, a, doing something, a launch of a new software or whatnot, and then you have a moment to celebrate. So you kind of know that I'm going for something, and then whew, there's this mo moment of recharge and celebration. We don't have that, because constantly there's a new project, and then you end it. So what we have done is we have really talked about it so much that we consciously celebrate the small victories at the end of every project. We very, you know, everyone shares the positive feedback that we have, and it has helped so much. And it doesn't cost anything, but to just raise the awareness of it. But I would like to hear your thoughts as well about how you help your employees recharge. I mean, there was something, you know, it was talked about flexibility and also kind of this, you know, gym membership or other sports, but any other good thoughts? Because we, we have to let our teams and ourselves as well recharge because, you know, it is tough. That's amazing. I actually have um, one thing that um, I just realized we have a very good HR team. I'm very proud of them. Uh, one thing that our HR team does, and it's really nice, we have these trips that we do. So with any, uh, with all our CSR organizations that we're affiliated with, we do like um, a half day or a one day on a Saturday um, trip to go see the children, like a, or if it's an old age home, and we allow that to happen. And it is one of the most amazing things because it's voluntary. A lot of people volunteer to go for it. They spend the day there, and it, they come back with so much perspective because they realize that what they're stressed about, we're not, we're not ultimately we're not finding the cure of cancer, and it's important to remember that. And we must learn how to zoom in and zoom out. And this is something that they do, and it really helps the team get perspective sometimes. Yeah, that's great. We also do, uh, we allot everyone a half day of PTO per year that can be used just for volunteer projects, charity work. Yeah. And usually we do that in groups. And I think I hadn't really taken the perspective of getting that fresh perspective, which is so important. But I also think it's nice to remember your coworkers in a different kind of way, that you enjoy them okay. as people, not just people doing work like you're doing, but you, you're there for a common cause, you're having a few laughs, I think that's really nice. Um, and, and we also have a group of people in our, um, in one of our locations, actually in a couple of our locations that do like a happy hour. It's like, let's make sure we do get done. And they, they leave 15 minutes early, it's not like a big deal, but they just really look forward to that. And I think that's a recharge and a sense of community that I think is um, really important. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it's interesting because I think as a group of people, um, I can't think of a better group of people, and I've been involved with you guys for yeah, yeah, longer, longer than I care to remember or, or care to reveal. But we're, we're generally a quite kind, generous group of people. You know, we, there's lots of hugging and there's lots of smiling whenever we get together as a group. And I think sometimes remembering that energy and taking that energy back to your organisations, the power of two words, thank you, is immense and I don't think we use them enough ever. I don't think we use them to our staff enough. I don't think we use them to our clients enough or assignees, but they're really powerful words because they just engender positivity. And I was at a, a, a conference last week in Liverpool and they had a sales trainer, very famous sales trainer, and he, he wrote a book called Be Brilliant. Be Brilliant, right, of course you all want to be brilliant. And his, his kind of mark is, Whenever he introduces himself or he meets somebody and they say, oh, how are you? His response is, I'm brilliant! <laughs> and everybody laughs at him because it's so, like what you expect when you say, how are you? Is, oh, I'm all right, you know, weather's a bit mean, you know, work's tough. 
and it just that's how you react to that person. But because he's so up, and I'm not suggesting that we all walk around buffing up our chest and shouting, be brilliant at everybody, but, but just taking that attitude to things is, is such positivity comes from it. And it can change the dynamic of anything. So we, we have control for very small things to make a big difference to our teams. Sorry for scaring anybody with my big finger, <laughs> by the way. I think it was your turn to stand up anyway. So we, um, I don't know a better place to end on Be Brilliant. So it looks as though the, the five of us could talk about this topic for a long time, and I'm sure you have additional insights. I encourage you to share them with each other. That's what this conference is all about. There's just a half day left, but keep sharing these best practices, and let's continue to make this industry a great place to work in. Thank you. Thank you.